I know it's been a while. I know you guys have been waiting for a video and here it is. Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and to another Mystery Monday video, even though this may be going up before Monday because it's gonna be in several different parts. So I'm gonna just start off by saying that I have a couple things to say about the case before I get into the case. If you're one of those people that likes to complain in the comments that I talked about something else before I actually got into the case, if you check the description box, there's usually timestamps uh, where you can go in the video to bypass that. So always check the description box first before you make a comment about how I talked too much before the video because there are people who want to know the background and want to know how I felt about this case and wanted to know my process going into the case. And that is for those people. And if you guys want to skip that, there's timestamps in the description box. Okay. So when I was researching this case, I didn't expect it to be as extensive as it was. And I started off by watching the documentaries first. So I watched all three Paradise Lost documentaries. And then I watched West of Memphis. And I even watched the Devil's Knot movie with Reese Witherspoon. I started that way because I knew it would be the most generalized place to start. I knew it wasn't going to have all the accurate information. I know that movies and documentaries typically pick a side and kind of portray that side in the best light. So I wasn't expecting to get everything from the documentaries, but I knew it would give me a base place to start. I would be able to figure out who the most important players were, um, times and dates and things like that. And then I could use that information basically as like a skeleton to then flesh out through online research of my own. So that is what I did. And I also um, got Damien Eccles' book, Life After Death. I got it on Audible, so I got an audiobook of it, and I listened to that. And I also listened to The Devil's Knot, which is another book that the movie's based on. So that was where my media research started, and then, like I said, I just fleshed out what I got from each separate kind of movie or book and did my own research to expound on that. So don't think that I just sat here and watched the documentaries and that was it, that's all I did. So if you are looking for a really basic Wikipedia recitation of the West Memphis Three case, this video is not for you. This video is probably gonna have to be in two, maybe even three parts. What happened in this case? Are the West Memphis Three guilty? Are they innocent? Who did it? I really wanna get your guys' input, so let's discuss it in the comment section and let's get started. On May 5th, 1993, three eight-year-old boys were reported missing in West Memphis, Arkansas. Stephen Edward Branch, also called Stevie, was born on November 28th, 1984. He was a second grader at Weaver Elementary School and he was really well liked by his classmates. He had beautiful blonde hair, blue eyes, a really sweet smile, kind of a mama's boy, and he was just described as being really friendly and outgoing. Stevie lived with his mother, Pamela Hobbs, his stepfather, Terry Hobbs, and his little sister, Amanda Hobbs, who was four at the time of his disappearance. The day he went missing, Pamela and Amanda walked Stevie home from Weaver Elementary around 2.45 p.m. the afternoon of May 5th. And when he got home, he settled in to work on his homework a little bit. Pamela was making dinner when one of his friends came over. Michael Moore came to Stevie Branch's house around 3 p.m. that day after school and he asked Stevie if he could go ride bikes with him and Stevie had just received a new bike from his grandfather and he was really excited to get on it and start riding. It's possible the boys even talked about it that day at school, like that they were planning on riding bikes after school. So Pamela said, yes, you can go, but I have to leave for work by 4.30, so you have to be back by 4.30. Pam worked the evening shift at the Catfish Island restaurant and her shift started at 5, so that's why she wanted Stevie home by 4.30 because her husband Terry Hobbs would be driving her to work. She'd lost her license due to a DWI so she couldn't drive herself 
to or from work. Terry always had to drive her there and back and he would obviously have to take the kids with them to take her to work because he didn't want to leave them home alone. So she told him be back by 4.30, he said I will and the boys you know, went out yelling and laughing just like little boys do on afternoons in May when they've been at school all day long and they just are so pumped to like get outside and ride their bike so they left and unfortunately Stevie did not make it back by the time Pamela would have to leave for work that evening. James Michael Moore, also called Mike, was born on July 27, 1984, son of Dana and Todd Moore, and he had an older sister named Dawn who was 10 years old at the time of his disappearance. He was an enthusiastic Cub Scout. He was super proud of being Cub Scout, and in fact, the day that he went missing, he was wearing his Cub Scout shirt, his Cub Scout hat, and he had a little golden badge on his shirt because he really liked to play as a police officer when they were playing. So he liked to pretend to be a police officer when he was playing. The afternoon of May 5th, as soon as Michael Moore got home from school, he rushed right over to Stevie Branch's house because he knew Stevie had just gotten a new bike and the weather was just starting to warm up and you know be nicer out, not as rainy from the spring, and they couldn't wait to get outside and play. Christopher Byers was born on June 23rd, 1984. His friends and family called him Chris, and he lived with his mother, Melissa Byers, and his stepfather, John Mark Byers. Chris was also a second grader at Weaver Elementary School, but he had become new friends with Stevie Branch and Mike Moore. Chris was diagnosed with ADHD and he was currently on Ritalin, but it didn't seem to be helping his erratic and hyperactive behavior. Nobody could figure out why. It really frustrated his parents, especially his stepfather, John Mark Byers. So he too, after school, goes over to Stevie's house. Maybe the boys all planned it during the day that they would meet up at Stevie's house, but he goes to Stevie's house and he gets there around 3.30. So the boys have already left at this point. But while he's at Stevie's house, he sees that one of his favorite shows, The Muppet Babies, is on, and Stevie's little sister Amanda's watching it, so he asks Pam Hobbs if he can just stay and watch the show for a little bit before he goes out to find the boys, and of course she agrees, so he settles in with Amanda and he watches an episode of The Muppet Babies with her. He left the Hobbs residence at around 4 p.m. to go find his friends. We don't know for sure, but it doesn't appear that he found the boys right away. He was seen riding his skateboard on his belly on North 14th Street. So basically, face down on the skateboard, riding down or up the street, which was dangerous because a car wouldn't have been able to see him. And his stepfather, John Mark Byers, did see him and was not too happy about it. So he grabbed him, gave him a beating, and told him to go home and clean the carport and the yard. And then he could go back out and play with his friends. Now, John Mark Byers had to go take his older son, Ryan, to a court appearance. So he left after he spanked Chris and brought Ryan wherever he had to go, but Melissa Byers was home. She was inside the house on the phone with her boss, and she said she saw Chris outside several times, and he even came in the house several times, in and out of the house, but she wasn't sure what he wanted because she was on the phone. So in the hours before the boys go missing, there are several eyewitness accounts of people around the neighborhood who see them. Deborah O. Tinger says she saw the boys playing in her yard a little bit before 6 p.m. and she knows that it was right before 6 because she was getting in the car to go to her mother's house for dinner and they were supposed to be there at 6 for dinner. These kids were playing in her yard and she basically said, you know, get out of my yard, go play someplace else. She also said she remembers them going into the woods after she kind of yelled at them but Sense has said she doesn't know if she saw them going into the woods or if she just assumed they went into the woods because the woods were right there. Dana Moore, Michael Moore's mother, she arrived home about 10 minutes after he got home from school 
and when she got home she said she saw him and Stevie Branch riding bikes on 14th Street. Later on about 6 p.m. she saw them riding north on 14th Street and she wanted Michael Moore to come home because she was making dinner and it was dinner time so she sent his 10 year old sister Dana Moore out to go bring him home. Dana Moore climbed on her bike, rode after the boys, but she didn't find them. She describes the teenagers as it being two black males and one white male, and the white male is wearing yellow and black shorts and a yellow and black t-shirt. And as she's riding by on her bike, one of them asks her, did she want a shot? And she got scared. She didn't know what that meant. She assumed it was drug related. And so she rode off on her bike away from them without speaking to them. Now she says this was around 5.30, which doesn't match up with her mother's timeline of asking Dana to go get the boys around 6. But we have to remember, this is 1993. This is a 10 year old girl. She's not wearing a watch. She doesn't have an iPhone in her pocket. She's riding her bike. You know, she probably wasn't exactly sure of what time it was. She claims to see the same three boys at a house north of Goodwin about 45 minutes later and at least two of them were going into this house. Kim Williams, another resident, says she saw Stevie Branch and Michael Moore walk into Robin Hood Hills between 5.30 and 6 and that she also later on saw two black teenagers and one white teenager leaving the woods. Between 6 and 6.30 p.m., the boys are seen playing a few houses down from the Hobbs residence by Jamie Clark Ballard, a neighbor. She remembers the time so specifically because she and her family were getting into the car to go to church. They went to church at the same time every Wednesday evening, and that's what they were doing when they saw the three boys. And Jamie Clark actually yelled out to them to go home. She told Chris that his brother was looking for him and he better get home and he kind of laughed at her and said you can't tell me what to do and they all rode away laughing like, like little boys. But then she also remembers Terry Hobbs walking down the street towards them, hollering at them to come back. And at that point all three boys turned around and rode back towards him. All three boys were seen by resident Cindy Rico around 6.30 by the drainage ditch in Robin Hood Hills. At 7 p.m., a man named Chris Wall says he sees all three boys. They're riding bikes. It's around 7 p.m. and he knows it was 7 p.m. because he took a night class and that is exactly when the class would get out every night. And he said they were riding in the direction of Robin Hood Hills and that it was starting to get dark out. Robin Hood Hills was roughly four acres of woods located between Interstate 40 and the neighborhood where the boys lived. Parents didn't really like their kids to play in this area, not only because it was dangerous and kind of out of the way, but the Blue Beacon Truck Wash was located right on the other side of the woods. And the Blue Beacon Truck Wash basically is a place where truckers can bring their semis to get washed, and it's also a place where there's restaurants and all sorts of little areas where the truckers can rest while their truck's getting cleaned and they can kind of take a break from their long ride. The truck wash sat on a service road off Interstate 40. Now Interstate 40 is one of the busiest highways in the United States and the economy of West Memphis depended on this truck wash as well as the surrounding businesses because the truckers would come through and spend their money and a big part of the economy of West Memphis was from this truck stop. Even though playing here was discouraged by parents, of course the kids still did. Kids of all ages liked to play there. Young ones, older ones, teenagers probably liked to hang out in the woods and smoke weed, drink alcohol. The little kids really liked it because there was trees to climb and it was kind of an adventure. I'm sure the woods provided adventure and entertainment, something that their small hometown was severely lacking. However, most of the kids would still stick to the southern part of the woods, the woods that were closest to their neighborhood. They didn't want to cross the big pipe bridge that went to the northern side of the woods, the side that bordered the Blue Beacon truck wash. And there was also like a drainage ditch in that area and the local kids called it the Devil's Den. Now let's talk about the parents quickly and their timeline of events of what they did and where they were that evening. John Mark Byers, Steve 
Evie's stepfather was the first to report him missing around 808 that evening. Officer Regina Meeks gets to the buyer's residence and the time on the report when she took the report says 8 10 p.m. So John Mark says the last time he saw Christopher was at 5 40 p.m. like we already talked about riding his skateboard down the middle of the street that he had given him a little bit of a beating told him to clean the carport in the yard and then he'd left and then Melissa Byers reinforces this by saying yes she saw Chris outside playing around 545 and then she just assumed that he was either you know in his room or that he had gone to play with his friends when John Mark Byers got home from bringing Ryan to his court appearance they both came back home and they wanted to go to dinner that night so that's why they were looking for Chris so heavily because usually it would have been pretty normal for him to be out kind of playing with his friends and not home until you know it got dark or it was dinner time but they wanted to go to dinner as a family so when John Mark and Ryan got home and Melissa Byers was already there Chris was the only one missing so they drove around looking for him John Mark and Ryan get home from this court appearance probably around 6 and that's when they start looking for Chris John Mark asks Melissa where he's at Melissa doesn't know she thinks he's in his room but John Mark's like no he's not and she's like well he's outside playing and John Mark's like no he's not I just came inside from there he's not outside so they kind of drive around the neighborhood a little bit and it's not a big neighborhood but they kind of drive slowly around looking for him just expecting that they're gonna see him wandering around playing with their friends throw him in the car so they can go to dinner they don't find him so then they go across the street from their house to Dana Moore's house they know that Chris is usually playing with Michael Moore Dana's son and they say have you seen Chris and she's like no and I, I can't find Michael either because they were playing together I just saw them go off in that direction I sent Dana after them to look for them but she can't find them Dana Moore also told the buyers that Terry Hobbs, Stevie Branch's stepfather, had been by earlier that evening as well looking for Stevie. Terry and the buyers had never met. Even though their kids played together, Chris Byers and Stevie Branch played together quite often, they lived in kind of two different areas of West Memphis and so they really hadn't crossed paths before. But John Mark Byers would meet Terry Hobbs that day while they were all kind of on the shared path of looking for their missing boys. So after Dana Moore tells the buyers she doesn't know where the kids are, she hasn't seen them, they kind of get back in the car and they go around the area a little bit more, driving around to see if they can find him. Maybe they'll see bikes sitting outside of somebody's house and know that the kids are there. And even though Chris Byers didn't have a bike and wasn't on his bike that day, he was on a skateboard, they figured he was with the other two kids. And if they could find those other two kids, they would find their son. They eventually do find Chris Byers skateboard but they don't ever find Chris. Officer Regina Meeks is taking in all this information, taking the statement, and at this point, Dana Moore comes over from across the street because she sees the police are there, and she tells Officer Meeks that her son's missing and isn't back yet either, and this is gonna be around 8.20 p.m. Officer Regina Meeks does not take an official statement at this time. She just tells Dana Moore, like, okay, I know that these two boys are missing together, so if I'm keeping an eye out for one, I'm probably gonna be keeping an eye out for the other, but if he's still missing in a little while, let me know and I'll file like an actual report. So at 8.29 p.m., according to Regina Meeks, she leaves the buyer's residence and kind of drives around a little bit looking for the boys, but at 8.42 p.m., she gets a call to go to the nearby Bojangles restaurant. It's like a fast food restaurant in the south. And um, so she's only looking for them for about like 11 minutes, right? She's only driving around kind of on the lookout for 11 minutes. So at 8.42, she gets this call to go to the Bojangles restaurant. There is some strange man there covered in blood hiding out in the women's restroom. So she heads over that way. So Officer Meeks gets to the Bojangles restaurant at about 8.50 p.m. But instead of parking and going into the restaurant to take the manager's statement, she pulls through the drive through to take the statement. And Marty King, the manager who had called the report in, comes to the window and he's like, well, do you want to like come inside? And she's like, no, you know, just tell me what you saw here. And he tells her what he saw. 
So Marty King tells her about 30 minutes before she got there, a tall black man, either bleeding or covered in blood, had stumbled into the restaurant, seemed disoriented and out of it, and he had gone into the women's bathroom and had kind of like stayed in there for quite a while. So somebody at one point had gone to check on him and they just saw this man sitting in the restroom covered in blood. He had actually like smeared blood on the walls and on the door of the women's restroom on the way into the restroom and then smeared blood on the walls of the women's restroom as well. So he was either covered in a lot of blood or he was bleeding pretty badly because he left quite a bit of blood in his wake. The manager Marty King also told Officer Meeks that he had left the restaurant on foot just a few minutes before she'd gotten there and he told her that he went behind the restaurant north towards the back dumpsters so he told her he was on foot. He told her the man hadn't left that long ago, just a couple of minutes, and he told her the direction he'd gone in. So the next plausible thing would have been for Regina Meeks either to go into the restaurant and look at the blood and the crime scene and kind of collect evidence or to follow the path that the man had taken to see if she could pick him up because she's in a police car, he's on foot. So she probably could have caught up to him pretty quickly, but she doesn't do either of these things. Instead, she takes a call for like a domestic disturbance, uh, criminal mischief, whatever, somebody's throwing eggs at somebody's house. So she's like, that sounds important. I'm gonna go find out who the egg thrower is. So according to Officer Regina Meeks, she took Dana Moore's official statement in 924 because Dana Moore reported Michael Moore missing um, when you know it was dark, it was like nine o'clock. They weren't home yet, so she finally you know, called in and was like, yeah, I remember that kid I told you about, he's still missing. And so Officer Regina Meeks finally took Dana's official statement at 9.24 p.m. So you might be wondering, where's Todd Moore, Michael Moore's father? We've talked about both parents of the other two kids, but we've only talked about Dana Moore. Well, Todd Moore was a trucker, so he was actually out on his route. He was nowhere near West Memphis at this time, and he wouldn't get home until 5 a.m. the next morning. So at this point, Regina Meeks now gets a call from the Catfish restaurant from Terry Hobbs, who's reporting his stepson Stevie Branch missing. And my question at this point is, are there no other cops in this town? Like Regina Meeks has taken three calls for missing boys, bloody guy at a restaurant, eggs getting thrown around. Are there no other police officers working tonight? What's going on? Let's quickly switch to Pam Hobbs and Terry Hobbs. As we touched on briefly earlier, Pam was dropped off to work at the Catfish Island restaurant by Terry Hobbs, and he dropped her off around 5 p.m., which is when her shift started. Terry Hobbs worked for Memphis Ice Cream, basically as like a traveling salesman. So he would travel between, I think, two or three states and take orders for ice cream, kind of check on the equipment, make sure it was still running smoothly if it needed to be repaired. He would do what he could. If it was something harder than he could do, he would kind of like outsource the repair and he would try to upsell, obviously. And he left very, very early in the morning to go to work. So he would typically be back quite early in the afternoon, sometimes as early as 2.30. Year three. On the afternoon of May 5th, he arrived home a little bit before four and he asked Pam, where's Frog Legs? Which is apparently what he called Stevie. Such a super nice nickname for a little boy. But he said, where's Frog Legs? And she said, he's still outside playing. And you know, I told him to be home by 4.30. But when Stevie didn't get home by 4.30, they all got into the car similar to the buyers and kind of drove around looking for him before Terry was like, Pam, we gotta get you to work. You gotta be there at five. You know, can't just drive around looking for him or you're gonna be late. So they decided that um, he would drop Pam off at work and then continue to look for Stevie. I think it's important to note that Terry Hobbs, in my opinion, was treated differently than any of the other parents by the police in the aftermath. He was never really questioned. He was never really asked to provide any DNA or hair samples. He sort of just flew under the radar for a long time. He was never really even asked for his alibi. And when he finally gave it, this is where he says he was after he dropped Pam off to work. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about both John Mark Byers and Terry Hobbs who were both eventually 
in the following years suspects in this case and we'll talk about their backgrounds a little bit and why they were suspected and what actual evidence tied them to these crimes. But for now we're just talking about Terry Hobbs alibi for the night that Stevie went missing and also what happened after he picked Pam up from the Catfish Island restaurant. Well, a man called David Jacoby, Terry Hobbs' friend, and I believe they both worked at the Memphis ice cream place. Um, he is Terry's only alibi. And Terry says that after he dropped Pam off at work, he went over to David's house because they're buddies, they work together, and he's like, hey, I can't find my stepson, have you seen him? And David's like, no, he, he hasn't been here. And Terry at this point has Amanda still, a little four-year-old Amanda, and he's like, well, do you think we can leave Amanda here with your wife? And they had often watched her before. I guess Terry made a habit of dropping Amanda off there and then kind of going and doing his own thing while Pam was at work in the evenings. So they'd watch watched Amanda before and Terry asked if if his wife could watch Amanda now and David would come with him to search for Stevie and according to Terry he was either with Amanda or with David Jacoby all night. He was never alone. Now here's David's statement. He doesn't remember exactly what happened, but he believes he got home from work around 4.30 p.m. the evening of May 5th, sometime between 5 and 5.30, and he does claim it could have even been as late as 6 p.m. Terry Hobbs arrived at the home of David Jacoby with Amanda. They came in, Amanda played with some toys, and David and Terry sat down to play guitars, which they often did. They played guitars together. So David says they played guitars for like an hour. Terry was helping David work on a song that he'd been trying to get right, and they kind of went over some of the chords. And then he finally was like, well, wait, where's Stevie? Like, Amanda's here, where's Stevie at? And then that's when Terry said, like, oh, he's missing. He hasn't come home yet. I probably should go look for him. That's when Jacoby tells Terry, well, I saw him with a couple of boys earlier riding bikes and one boy was on a skateboard, so, he, you know, is he just playing with friends? Like, when's he supposed to be home? And Terry was like, yeah, maybe I should go home and, you know, see if he's there. According to David Jacoby, he's 90% sure that Terry left Amanda there while he went home to check to see if Stevie was there. And he came back and he's like, Stevie's not home. Do we, do you think we can, like, go and check around the neighborhood for him? And David says, sure. So they once again leave Amanda there at the house at the Jacoby residence. He gets in the car with Terry and they kind of drive around for, like, 15 minutes when Terry's like, okay, so I'm gonna go home and change and we can like really start searching the woods and you know getting around. I'm gonna drop you off at home, I'll go change and then I'll come get you again. David Jacoby says that Terry dropped him off at his house and Jacoby changed, got some flashlights and waited for Terry to come back but he never did. At no point does Jacoby remember being in the woods with Terry Hobbs that evening. He said he did end up leaving on his own and going and searching the woods, so he was there, but he and Terry did not go there together, and there was a big chunk of the night that Terry would have been alone, even though Terry claimed after that he had never been without David or Amanda. So Terry Hobbs says he went to Robin Hood Hills between 6 and 6.30 looking for the boys because he had driven past some kids like at an apartment complex and asked a little girl, have you seen a boy with like blonde hair? And she said, yes, I saw them go into Robin Hood Hills. So he claims he was with David Jacoby between 6 and 6.30 in Robin Hood Hills searching for the boys. David Jacoby says he was in fact never with Terry Hobbs in Robin Hood Hills searching for the boys. He did go himself to search for them, but he was not in the woods until after dark. You'll see Terry being interviewed by the police years later. So you, I take it, you went in into this wooded area. Who all, do you remember who all went into that wooded area during the time you were there? I know when the police were called, Regina come out and she went in with us a little ways and turn around and come back out because it was it was hot and it was muggy and it was grown up and it was full of mosquitoes and you know everybody was getting mosquito bit. And Regina, is that, that a police officer? Regina Meeks. Okay, okay. There was a lot of people out there going yeah. through the woods. Do you remember, if you could tell me as many people as you can remember by name? David. Jacoby? Mm -hmm. okay. I didn't know anybody else. It kind of felt like they the police even felt bad to be in interviewing him after all those years. They never had initially. So anyways, let's get back to Pam Hobbs at the Catfish Island restaurant waiting for Terry to come pick her up from work. Terry shows up. 
He parks in the parking lot, he walks into the Catfish Island restaurant, says not one word to her, goes right to the payphone. So she's like, whatever, he's weird, he's grumpy, I'm not gonna deal with him. She goes to the gumball machine, gets a couple pieces of candy out, one for Stevie and one for Amanda, and she goes out to Terry's truck in the parking lot to give them their candy, say hi to them, and then wait in the truck for Terry. But the only child she finds in the truck is Amanda, no Stevie. Terry finally comes back to the truck and she's like, where is Stevie? And he says, you know, he never came home. I've been looking for him all night and I just called the police to report him missing. So Regina Meeks, Officer Regina Meeks, officer of all trades on every scene, able to handle multiple crime scenes and reports at once, she shows up to the Catfish Island restaurant. And Pam basically tells her what we've already talked about when she last saw Stevie, what he was wearing, what he was doing, who he would be playing with, and you know, then the statement was taken and the search continued. But there really wasn't a huge search going on from the police end of it. The evening of Wednesday, May 5th, saw the sun setting around 7.49 p.m. And after that, the only light to aid the many people who had come out to look for these boys was the light of the full moon. There was friends, there was family, people in the community all out searching for these three boys that by nine o'clock, everybody kind of realized they were missing and they could be in trouble. They focused a lot of their attention on the Robin Hood Hills, but they didn't find anything that night. And there really wasn't a police presence there. Even though all three kids have been reported missing, they didn't really send out anybody to search. Like John Mark Byers was leaving the woods at one point to knock on doors and see if he could get a flashlight from someone because it was dark and he needed help to see in the woods and he saw like a cop walking by and the cop was like, what are you doing? And John Mark was like, I'm looking for my son, he's missing along with two other boys. And the cop was like, wow, really? There's three boys missing, let me help. And then the cop went into the woods with John Mark Byers and his flashlight to help him, but it didn't seem like there was like an APB out, there wasn't a huge, you know, like bolo, and nothing was really happening on the police end. It was just a couple police officers who happened to be walking by and noticed that there was this huge search going on who decided to join up and help. At one point, John Mark Byers even called the sheriff's office and he was like, this is ridiculous. We have three eight-year-old boys missing. There's nobody out here. You guys haven't sent a search and rescue team. There's nothing happening. And he kind of like, you know, bitched them out a little bit because he couldn't believe that there could be three little boys missing and the police weren't really like doing anything. The only time Regina Meeks ever contacted them again that night was when she was about to get off shift and she was like, hey, I'm about to you know, go home and I'll let the person who comes on next know that the boys are missing and to keep a lookout for them. So it just seemed like the police were kind of like, let's walk around, do our usual route, go on our normal, on our normal way. And if we see them, then we see them. But they didn't send anybody out to search for them, really. You could hear the names of these three boys being shouted and screamed throughout the woods by their friends and their neighbors and their family. By 9.30, the woods and the streets of West Memphis were crawling with people who, you know, not only wanted to help, but also were kind of like interested in what was happening. Like I said, this is a small town. Nothing really exciting often happens here, so there was a lot of looky-loos, a lot of people who just kind of wanted to see what was going on, who wanted to get the inside scoop, who wanted to gossip. But for the most part, it was a lot of people who were helping to try to find Stevie, Michael, and Chris. Finally, around midnight, the search stalled. Of course it did, it was midnight, everybody was tired, it was hot in the woods, it was mosquito infested, it was pitch black. They couldn't see anything, and dejectedly, the parents and the people who had been helping up to the last minutes of the search that night, they kind of went home. John Mark Byers remembers that night and says he was unable to sleep. He couldn't rest, he just sat up in a chair all night by himself, watching the clock and waiting for the sun to rise. Around 5.30 a.m., he received a knock on his door and he ran to it excitedly, obviously thinking maybe it was his stepson or somebody who knew something. So outside his door was Todd Moore, who had just returned home from his trucking route and found out his son was missing. Terry Hobbs, 
Stevie Branch's stepfather and Jackie Hicks, who was the father of Pam Hobbs, so Stevie Branch's maternal grandfather, the one who had given him the bike. So they're outside and they're like, let's start searching again. So this is the morning of May 6th, bright and early, these parents start looking for their kids again. And at this point, the police do get involved, finally, thank you. So at this point, around 9 a.m. that morning, May 6th, Detective Gary Gitchell announces that he will be heading up the investigation for the Lost Boys. But the state police come out, the West Memphis PD, surrounding area police departments, they all come together to help, and at this point there is a big search and rescue effort made for the boys. So this time, they've got the police force, they have still the community of volunteers who's helping looking for the boys, and they start combing the woods at Robin Hood Hills again. But this time in the light of day, so they're hoping to have better luck, but they don't find anything. They're in the woods for hours, they don't find anything, and everybody's starting to get discouraged, people are leaving. Even police officers are like packing up and just heading out to kind of reconvene and figure out what to do next. That is when Steve Jones, a Crittenden County juvenile probation officer, very long title, but he's a juvenile probation officer, he sees a black laceless tennis shoe floating in the creek. And he calls everybody over, you know, whoever can hear, he's like shouting, like, come over here, come over here. And a couple other police officers come and they all kind of stand there looking at the shoe for a while, like, how did we miss this? We've been here all morning, all afternoon looking. How did we miss this shoe? And then finally, after they kind of look at the shoe for a while. Are you serious? Finally, after they're kind of looking for this shoe for a while, it's decided that somebody obviously has to go into the water and see if the boys are in there. Now this water is it's a murky, it's a muddy, it's a brown, you can't see through it. It's extremely dirty. So the officer who volunteers to go in, and his name is Brian Ridge, he steps forward, he's like, I'm gonna do this. He goes in the water, but he has to crawl on his hands and knees in about three feet of water. You can't see through to the bottom, you can't see through at all. So he has to go on his hands and knees and kind of crawl along the really muddy, almost quicksand like creek bed, and it's like sucking him in. You know, it's like quicksand, and he's crawling along the bottom of the creek bed and feeling with his hands, you know, if he can if he can feel anything and he finally does feel something and he pulls the thing he feels out of the water and it's the body of Michael Moore. So he cradles Michael in his arms and places him on the creek bed. He keeps kind of crawling around and soon finds the bodies of Christopher Byers and Stevie Branch who he then picks up as well, and he also places them on the side of the creek along with Michael Moore. Whatever you wanna say about the police officers in this case, if it was mishandled, if there was a bias and prejudice related to this case, that had to have been an extremely, incredibly tough thing to go through. Like, you have to basically crawl in this water you can't see through almost hoping to find the bodies of these boys because at this point you don't know where they are and when you do find one body you know there's more and you have to search now knowing that there's more bodies in here. So that had to, I'm sure, haunt Brian Ridge forever, a very long time, being the one to remove them from the water. So all three boys are completely naked. They have their wrists tied to their ankles. I've heard it described as being hogtied. So hog tying is tying your ankle to the opposite wrist and vice versa. And these boys were tied up with their left wrist tied to their left ankle and their right wrist tied to their right ankle. So they weren't hog tied. Michael Moore appears to have been viciously attacked and beaten. He suffered a lot of damage to his face and head. Stevie had lacerations on his neck face and head as well, and there's also several bite marks on Stevie. Finally, Chris Byers, who was found face down, he shows signs of being beaten as well, and he is also found to be castrated. The officers discovered that the bodies were anchored to the creek bed with sticks. Their clothes, which were obviously removed from their body, were also anchored to the creek bed with sticks. They find almost all of the articles of clothing except for two pairs of underwear and one sock. And some people have speculated saying, well, they were eight-year-old boys, maybe they weren't wearing underwear, but the parents of all three say, like, yes, they, they knew they had to wear underwear every day. They were definitely wearing underwear, so 
Two pairs of the jeans that were found were still buttoned and zippered, but they were pulled inside out. So it's unclear whether the jeans were pulled off of them or whether they undressed themselves, maybe to go swimming at some point, and that's how little boys pull their pants off. I will show you my laundry basket. Aiden takes his pants off inside out without unbuttoning anything every time. And half the time his underwear is still like stuck in there and half the time he just leaves it on the floor where he took it off and I put it in the hamper. So it's unclear whether they were taken off of them or the boys took them off themselves. Now that they found the bodies, it's up to Detective Gary Gitchell to break the news to the family. And the family's currently staying outside of the police zone now. So there's the woods and they have tape you know, yellow caution tape set up around the woods to prevent anybody from coming in. And the family and the press and the community, they're all gathered outside of this yellow tape at this point, just kind of waiting to see and find out what the police discovered. Pam Hops, her reaction is actually captured on camera. She basically is just wailing from incredible pain, the pain of a mother that's just discovered her her son is dead and it's really traumatic like you hear her just screaming the sound that she made is a sound that results from what i can only guess is her heart just splintering into a million pieces so the bodies are discovered at about 1.40 p.m., but the medical examiner's office isn't called until almost two hours later at about 3.20. They received a call from the West Memphis PD letting them know they'd found the bodies and to pull into the Blue Beacon truck wash. Now, now the woods in Robin Hood Hills, they're so dense, there's no way to actually get a vehicle into the woods to pick up the boys' bodies. So the police officers on scene, they actually have to wrap the bodies in sheets and then place them in body bags and actually physically carry them out to the Blue Beacon parking lot so that they can be put into the medical examiner's van. And I, I can't even imagine how horrific that must have been to have to wrap up these young children's bodies and then carry them out of the woods, which I'm sure wasn't a short walk. Once again, no matter how badly the police may have botched this investigation at a later time or even in small ways in the beginning, a lot of them dealt with some seriously horrific stuff that I'm sure stayed with them forever. So it was pretty evident to everyone at this point, everyone on the scene, that this was a triple murder, this was a homicide, it wasn't an accident. Because of the wounds on the boys, because of the things that had been done to their bodies, and because they'd clearly been concealed. Somebody had taken sticks and pinned them to the bottom of the creek bed in order to prevent them from coming up and being found as early on as they would have been had they just been left in the woods. Because if you think about it, if they'd just been left in the woods and not put in the water, their bodies would have been discovered the night before when everybody was looking for them. Law enforcement officials also find the boys' bikes, two bikes, about 50 feet away, also in the water. Okay. Where were these found, guys? Green went on the left side there. Red went on the right side. 231. 231. Don't let nobody come up here. Don't want nobody in here. Now remember that Stevie Branch and Michael Moore both had bikes, but Chris Byers had been using a skateboard that day, so he had been riding tandem with one of the other boys using their bikes, probably because he couldn't keep up with them on his skateboard, so they were probably like, just get on so we can you know, get going and get to where we have to go faster. So they only found the two bikes. Chris Byers' skateboard had been found the night before by his parents. The bikes were loaded into the back of an animal control transport truck, so there was really no care taken to put a tarp down or to wrap them up to preserve any evidence that was on the bikes or to prevent anything that was in the back of the animal control truck from getting on the bikes. The bikes were not even actually tested for any evidence or DNA until a month later and Gary Gitchell claims that there was no DNA or evidence found on these bicycles. So at this point, as is normal in a small town, the word has started to spread. People are talking to each other, the media shows up, 
they want a statement and Gary Gitchell has to give them one because they're there waiting with the families who are distraught. They're there waiting for a statement and he basically says, we don't know much about this. The only thing we do know is that this case is now considered a triple homicide. The state police who have more manpower and resources than the West Memphis PD do ask Gary Gitchell if he would like their help in this investigation. And he says, no, this is a local matter. We'll handle it locally. Thanks for your help in the search, but we'll take it from here, which is something I can never understand about these law enforcement officials. It just seems like such a matter of ego rather than logic. And the same thing happened in the John Bonet Ramsey case with the Boulder Police Department now wanting help from the FBI. Why wouldn't you want as much help as you could get? Why wouldn't you want these crimes solved as soon as possible and just by logic, the more help you have, the more manpower, the more resources, the sooner you'll be able to solve the crime. But it, it seems to me when when an official in law enforcement who's in control of making these decisions makes a decision to not accept help, it's like an ego thing. It's a it's a marking your territory kind of thing. We can do this, we're plenty capable, we've got it, thanks, we'll take it from here. Gary Gitchell wasn't all bad though. In a very strategic move, he decided to withhold and conceal a great deal of information about the specifics of the crime scene from everybody. So he didn't tell the press, he didn't tell the families, he didn't tell anybody. Only the officers that were on the scene would have known about these details. And he did this, and it's a common move in law enforcement, he did this because he figured if they were talking to people or interviewing people later, if those people knew something that only they knew about the crime scene and that hadn't been released publicly, they would probably more than likely have their culprit. This kind of tactic was not easy in the small town of West Memphis. Of course, as I already said, gossip spread like wildfire. Even though the police officers were police officers and had the professionalism on the scene, who knows what they would have done when they went home. Most likely they would have told their families and friends what they had witnessed at the scene because it was traumatic and they most likely would want to share it with somebody. And the word would spread from there. Additionally, the Memphis Commercial Appeal used their newsroom to go on a police scanner and listen in to what the police were saying about it. And it was then that they heard the state police discussing specifics of the case over the scanner. And they put out a paper the next morning with a very tantalizing headline. Within no time, what has since become known as satanic panic basically enveloped West Memphis, Arkansas. It may seem ridiculous to the average person living in 2018 that even the suggestion that these deaths would have had something to do with cults or devil worshiping in a small town like West Memphis would just be, it would be crazy. It wouldn't even happen. But we're talking about the perfect storm of time, place, and circumstances. West Memphis, Arkansas was and still is a deeply religious area, smack dab in the middle of the Bible Belt. Additionally, the past three decades leading up to the 90s had built this sort of fear around Satanism, devil worshippers, cult activity. Especially in a place like West Memphis, and I don't want anybody to be offended by this, but it's just statistics and demographics. The average person didn't make that much annually. The average person wasn't always highly educated. And the average person was deeply religious. So that combination doesn't make for a very open-minded or accepting personality. The year 1969 was hallmarked by a string of cult murders carried out by Charles Manson and his followers. The same year, organist turned occultist Anton LaVey published the Satanic Bible, which became known as the seminal work of modern Satanism. In 1971, William Peter Blatty's novel, The Exorcist, was released and rose to the top of the bestseller list. 1973 saw it turned into a movie. In 1978, the Jonestown Massacre terrified the world and gave every person a perpetual fear of cults. 
The 1970s also saw a string of evil serial killers who operated in a ritualistic way. The Zodiac Killer, Son of Sam, the Hillside Strangler, Ted Bundy. This began the epidemic of fear that you could not trust anyone, even people you knew. And you may not even be safe in your own home or your own town. This fear was reinforced in the 1980s when missing children started to appear on milk cartons. There was reports of killer clowns preying on children. There was scares like the Tylenol murders and the Halloween candy epidemic. And I was born in 1984, so this was two years after these Halloween candy poisonings were going on. But even as a small child, while I was trick-or-treating, I remember bringing a huge bag of candy home and my mother would check every single piece and I would watch as she threw what I considered to be perfectly good pieces of candy in the garbage just because the wrapper might have been a little off or just something didn't seem right about it to her. In 1988, Geraldo Rivera's documentary Devil Worship Exposing Satan's Underground premiered and became the most watched documentary to that date. A 1991 episode of 2020 publicized an actual live Roman Catholic exorcism. And in 1989, a Christian documentary called Hell's Bells warned of the dangers of rock and roll, heavy metal music, striving to prove that this type of music was tied to rebellion, sex, drugs, and the devil himself. Many court cases in the 80s and 90s swirled with an occult suggestion. Outright accusations of witchcraft and Satanism and devil worshiping would infiltrate the entire legal system in this time. Kern County, where 26 people were sent to prison for being accused of drinking blood, child sacrifice, and related things based on the world of small children that had been coached to say these things. The McMartin trial, where an unlicensed psychotherapist interviewed 400 children who attended the McMartin preschool and determined that 359 of them had been abused. The children allegedly said the daycare workers brought them to secret tunnels to transport them to rituals, they sacrificed babies, and they would actually turn into witches and fly. And this is literally only a small handful of examples where the American public was being indoctrinated by this fear of the occult and the devil. If you want me to do an entire video on this whole satanic panic thing and go more in depth into these cases that I just referred to, please let me know in the comments and I would absolutely love to do that. Let me ask you something else. If you're not a person that believes history repeats itself, how could something like this happen in the 90s or the 80s after what happened in Salem during the witch trials? The case of the three murdered boys was given the case number 9305066. This was presented as a coincidence, but it was soon discovered that the original case number had ended in 555. So the officers had actually changed the report to end in 666, the number of the beast. Now on May 6th, when the bodies were found, the officers were called back to that Bojangles restaurant where the bloody man had been spotted the night before. You know, where Regina Meeks did her excellent police work in the drive-thru of the Bojangles restaurant. The manager that Meeks had spoken to the night before had seen on the news that the three boys were missing, and given the location of the Bojangles restaurant, which was less than a mile away from Robin Hood Hills, where the boys were suspected to have wandered off into, he thought that the two incidences might be connected. So he called the police again, let them know about the connection that he thought was there, and a couple officers showed up. One of these officers is Detective Brian Ridge, and when they walk into the restaurant, they are fresh from the crime scene where they've just found the bodies of three young boys. They literally have mud up to their waists. They're covered in mud and dirt and soaking wet and probably dejected and broken inside as well. So at this point they take his statement and they are told much of the same, what he told Officer Meeks the night before. This time though it's also stated that the man who came into the restaurant that was covered in blood was also wearing a blue 
sort of brace on his arm and there was white velcro on that brace and that he'd also left a pair of sunglasses in the ladies bathroom. Now they assumed that they were his sunglasses or they belonged to him because they found the sunglasses when they were cleaning up the blood after he he left the restaurant the night before. Now these sunglasses were never recovered. It's suspected they might have been thrown out but the officers did take blood scrapings from the wall in the hallway as well as from the wall in the ladies room. But most of this blood, like I said, had already been wiped away and cleaned up using pretty strong chemicals. This was a restaurant. The employees couldn't just leave blood splattered on the walls. It wouldn't have been hygienic. So they did clean up most of the blood, but the officers were able to scrape some off the wall. Now, they were supposed to send this evidence to the, the lab to be looked at, but they never did. And when they were asked what happened to the evidence in court later, Detective Brian Ridge says he lost it. Detective Ridge, what is the date that you sent the blood scrapings off to the crime lab to be analyzed? They were never sent. They were never sent? That's correct. Where are the, the blood samples at this time? I don't know, sir. They're what? lost. They're lost? Yes, sir. That's my mistake. I lost a piece of evidence. Gone. Another striking comment though made by Marty King, the manager of that Bojangles restaurant, is when he was giving a description of the man, he pointed at the officers who like I said were muddy all on their pants and said he was muddy, he was dirty, he had mud on his pants just like you guys do now, which was pretty damning considering they had just come from wading in the same creek that they found the boys' bodies in. The morning of May 6th, something else happens that causes this whole catalyst of events to follow. Vicki Hutchison was reporting to the Marion Police Department that morning for an unrelated incident. This was a standing appointment. She was already supposed to have been meeting an officer there that morning. What had happened is she worked at a truck stop and there had been some overcharging of credit cards happening at the truck stop and the owners thought she might have something to do with it. So they had questioned her and they wanted her to take a polygraph and basically she was going in that morning to see what the results were of the investigation. She ended up being cleared but she lost her job anyways. I don't think the owners really trusted her. Given what we're about to find out about her, I don't really blame them. So she's at the Marion Police Department talking to Officer Donald Bray and she's brought her eight-year-old son Aaron with her and Officer Bray is a little agitated because Aaron in the normal family fashion of an eight-year-old boy is running all over the place and just being wild and kind of getting into things he shouldn't be getting into and he kind of says like why wouldn't you have left your son somewhere else this probably isn't the best place for him and she states to him well I thought you might want to talk to my son because he is actually friends with those boys that are missing so at this time it's the morning of May 6th and they don't know yet or it hasn't at least been publicly released yet that the three boys are no longer missing but are found dead. So she says Aaron is a friend of the three boys that are missing and one of those boys actually came to our house yesterday to see if Aaron could go and play with them and go to Robin Hood Hills. And I don't like Aaron playing in Robin Hood Hills. I think it's dangerous, like all the other parents did, and I said no. So now Bray has a legitimate interest in Aaron Hutchinson, and he just kind of talks to him a little bit about Michael and Stevie and Chris, and wants to know a little bit about them, just the way you would talk to an eight-year-old, not trying to scare him, but just trying to get information from him. And you know, Aaron talks a little bit about how they often go to Robin Hood Hills to play. They have a playhouse out there and they've even been known to swim in the creek from time to time. He then says that he saw Michael Moore after school on May 5th talking to a tall skinny black man with yellow teeth and this black man drove a maroon sedan. This man was telling Michael Moore that Mike's mother had sent him to pick Michael up from school and bring him home. When Michael Moore's mother is asked, she says absolutely not, I didn't send anybody to pick Mike up from school that day, plus we live so close to the school, he always just walks home and he walked home that day. Now to me, I don't know how she knew he walked home that day, she didn't get home until he had already been home from school and out playing with the other two boys. I think it's possible that somebody may have tried to pick him up from school that day saying that his mother had sent him but maybe Michael who had been informed about stranger danger and all those things had said no I'm good I'm gonna walk home. Maybe this guy then followed him home to see where he lived 
anything could have happened and by the time Michael got home it would have slipped his mind to even let anybody know that somebody had tried to pick him up after school he just wanted to get outside and play with his friends so to me that's a possibility that I don't think was ever looked into enough in this case so at this time Bray calls the West Memphis PD and says hey I've got this kid here he knows the three boys who are missing he might have something and that is when the West Memphis PD informs him that this is no longer a missing persons case but a triple homicide. Officer Bray gets off the phone and kind of makes the decision and takes it upon himself to continue questioning Aaron thinking he might get something from him. Now remember we're talking about an eight-year-old boy here. He was interviewed by Bray and by the West Memphis PD several times and his story dramatically changed from retelling to retelling. Eventually Aaron says that the boys were all playing at the clubhouse that day, that he had climbed into a tree and was hiding there when he saw five men who were appeared to be teenagers or grown-ups but their faces were painted and they were wearing satanic looking jewelry with skulls and snakes on them and he actually witnessed the three boys be tortured and raped and abused. We would see by looking at the autopsy report that none of the boys had actually been sexually abused and definitely not raped so this was obviously an inconsistency with the story. Another inconsistency was they never found a playhouse in the woods that he spoke of, never. Aaron goes on to say that while he's up in the tree witnessing this horrific scene, he falls out of the tree, the men see him and grab him because they've realized that he's witnessed what they've done and they tie him up. But he somehow manages to escape and he runs away but then he just never mentions it to anybody that night. His story evolves at some point where he's being made to take part in the mutilation of his friends and you know he's made to drink their blood and it's just more dramatic and creative with each story that he tells. What I thought was interesting was when he was interviewed by the police and he told them he was up in the tree and he fell out and then he got captured and tied up and then he ran away, he said he had hurt himself when he'd fallen from the tree. He hurt himself pretty bad, he fell on his back. But the police never asked to see where he had hurt himself, to see if there's a bruise there, to corroborate him falling out of the tree. And they never seemed to question how an eight-year-old boy who was tied up managed to escape from five grown, cold-blooded killers who had just murdered three other boys. There are transcripts of his interviews online and a couple videos of his interviews as well. I will put the transcripts in the description box and the links to the videos if you want to check it out. But you can tell he's being led in these interviews. You can tell that they keep asking him questions that are going to kind of lead them in the direction that that they want him to go in and he's eight so he's used to doing what adults want he's used to trying to appease adults and behave himself and be obedient so he follows where they lead but it's not until his interview with Gary Gitchell which is two or three interviews after his first initial interview where he ends up naming three suspects Basically, Aaron says a ton of messed up stuff, but he names three teenagers that the police are already interested in. Vicki Hutchinson even says later that she peeked into the interview room where Aaron was being interviewed and there was Polaroids on the wall of different people that could have been suspects and there was one Polaroid there that was front and center and much bigger than the other ones. And when Aaron was 19, I believe he was 19, he did an interview where he said the police twisted his words, that they hadn't really listened to him, that he felt they had a story in mind that they wanted, and they weren't really gonna be happy with what he had to say until he gave them that story. Additionally, Vicki Hutchison says that Gary Gitchell made her and Aaron and Officer Bray sign an affidavit of silence. Because during his first interview with Officer Bray, Aaron Hutchinson had said, I think that John Mark Byers did this because he didn't like Chris at all. They didn't get along and he didn't really like any kids and I think he could have done this. Gary Gitchell makes Vicky and 
Officer Bray and Aaron signed this affidavit of silence saying that they will never reveal the fact that Aaron said John Mark Byers' name in that first interview. It was only until later that Vicki Hutchison realized there's no such thing as an affidavit of silence. It's not an actual legal form. You know, she had been lied to and she kind of figured that out as some time went on. There's a lot about Aaron's story that causes me to believe Vicky coached him and told him what to say. And we'll get a little bit more into Vicky in a moment. So we've put a pin into a lot of people, right? We've put a pin into John Mark Byers, we've put a pin into Terry Hobbs, and we've put a pin into Vicki Hutchinson because they are all going to pop back up later in this case in many different ways. Jerry Driver and his buddy and fellow juvie officer Steve Jones, and if that name sounds familiar, it's because Steve Jones is the same person who found the black tennis shoe floating in the creek the day that the boys were found in the water. Jerry and Steve Jones had been trying to convince the local police department for over a year that there was satanic activity going on in West Memphis. I mean, they were obsessed. They read books about witchcraft and Satanism and cult activity, trying to get down all the symbolism and terminology and, you know, so they would know what to look for in the teenage population of West Memphis. They would even go so far as to drive around isolated areas on a full moon so that they could catch the Satanists in the act. They contacted a self-proclaimed occult expert in Ohio so that they could get his input on the activity that was happening in West Memphis, how it was taking over the teenage population. They wanted his help in how to handle and put a stop to all the devil worshiping going on in West Memphis, Arkansas. As I was reading more about Jerry Driver and Steve Jones and their basically occult task force that they had created, it seemed more and more to me that they were the ones that were a little bit obsessed with Satanism and all that jazz. Like maybe they were more interested in it than they than they wanted to let on. Who drives around on a full moon looking for Satanism in the forest so that you can what, like break in on it? I mean, if these people are actually working with the devil, which they believed, what are you guys gonna do running up on this cult ring in a forest? Mm -hmm. 